A um, couple things as we get started this morning. I, I'm running late. Meant Like in my head, I'm running late. Like my body's here, but my head's still a couple steps behind. A couple of announcements as we get started. Please update your information. So we have a database, right, with all your stuff in it. If you use your cell phone and text the word me to the church's phone number, it'll pop up with a form for you to fill out. So we can make sure that we have your email address and your phone number and stuff like that. Of course, if you want to keep hiding from us, don't do this. But if you text me to that number, it'll update your information. Uh, tonight we'll do Bible study. Our children and youth ministry is working to support Project Noel, which helps children uh, whose parents are in trouble. And so we're taking donations at this box right outside the door and to the right. I just need to breathe because I was just running around. <laughs> On December 3rd, so we're getting into the end of November. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That Thanksgiving is this week. Um, on December 3rd, there'll be church decorating after church. So stay for lunch and then help decorate the church. It's always a good time. And then 12-7, December 7th, if you're a lady and you'd like to participate in the cookie exchange, bring three dozen cookies to my house. <laughs> bring three dozen cookies to the church, and then you can swap, like your favorite kind of cookie, you can swap them around with the ladies on the 7th from 6.30 to 8. Uh, communication card, this is another way you can just let us know who you are and how you're doing. You can put a prayer request or a praise on the back, and we will certainly pray for you. You ready to get started? Yes. Let's pray together and we'll get started. Thank you, Lord, so much for all that you've given us, Father. Help us as we lift up our voices in praise to you this morning in Christ's name. Amen. All right, please stand. Hi. Everybody's running behind this morning. That was me. <laughs>
nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Him.
child of God. I'm a child of God. I was dead, I'm alive again. That's what Yahweh says. That's what Yahweh says. That's what Yahweh says.
Lord, I just pray that the words that we just sang would be our prayer. I don't think I need to add anything to it. Thank you for being our way maker. Be with us the rest of the service. Give us a deeper understanding of all the promises that are fulfilled in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You guys are a tough act to follow this morning. Amen, go home. <laughs> uh, so, okay, some programming notes, which I know it's kind of a buzzkill, right? We're on this real spiritual high, but um, so we're on Thanksgiving week, right? So we have Romans today. We'll have Romans next week after Thanksgiving. You'll all have that bloated feeling and that turkey look in your eyes next week on, on Sunday from turkey sandwiches. And then we're going to take, you know, the month of December is going to be Christmassy, right? So December 3rd, we're going to have Luke Fetters come, and we'll start doing some Christmas stuff. We'll take a break from Romans, and then we'll come back on December 31st. And keep going. Uh, Lord willing, we'll finish by Easter, right? And I know it can get kind of long. Uh, my, friend, my friend Bob um, <clears throat> my friend Bob is a curmudgeon. Like It's kind of like his job. And he, when we were leaving that church and coming here and making some changes, he said to me, and this is a compliment, he said, I've gotten used to your preaching because you give the context. Now, that doesn't sound like much of a compliment, does it? But when you understand Bob, you'll understand that's a, that's a pretty good compliment. So I'll try to keep, you, keep up with the context, and we'll keep going with the Bible study at 7 o'clock on uh, Sunday evenings. So this week and next week we'll do that, and then we'll take uh, December off for the most part. The other programming note is that we're not passing the baskets anymore, right? We still are taking an offering. That's your your obligation before God to, to give money to the church, support the ministries of the church, but we're not passing the baskets anymore. So I'm, I'm just going to trust you with all that, right? Have you ever had something happen that just ruined your whole day? Has that, has that ever happened to anybody or is it just me, right? I almost put in, uh, I have a picture from, I was in a truck accident last December and I almost put that picture up there, but I didn't want to traumatize anybody because somebody's car caught fire and burned up. And I have the picture of my truck off to the side, this kid's car completely on fire. It's a great picture, but it's a little traumatizing. So I didn't put it up there. And you know what? That ruined my whole day. I was, I was on my way. I was uh, helping somebody do something, right? I had my truck full of stuff, and I was in this accident, and all of a sudden, you know what I'm doing? Something different. All day. And you know, the best thing about that truck is it was paid for. You ever drive around and it paid for? Oh, that is a beautiful thing. It doesn't matter if it's got, you know, three tires and the engine lights on. It's paid for, man. Every day is free. Even a day full of positive things, even if the day is full of great and wonderful things, that one bad thing can kind of set you off. If it's raining when you're supposed to go to Cedar Point, oh, man. And especially when, when your kids were expecting to go to Cedar Point and it starts raining. Car repairs, not just the expense, but the inconvenience of having your car tied up. When you're struggling with health problems, big health problems, scary health problems, relationship problems. Sometimes the bad things feel so much bigger than the good things that they just are like all of the good things in your life are just drowned out by the bad things. And sometimes that becomes like a, a habit of life. So that everything that you see that is bad overwhelms everything that's good in your life and you're, you're in this trap called negative filtering, okay? And so everything that happens, it's like completely negative. And then it goes to always. This always happens to me. It always happens. Maybe it's me. 
It always rains when I want to go to Cedar Point. Or maybe even worse, God's out to get me. These are disordered automatic thoughts. They happen. They pop into your brain. It's hard to get rid of them. And when they take over, it's hard to break out of that pattern. When disordered automatic thinking becomes the way we encounter and interpret the world around us, then it takes work to reorder our thoughts. If I think it's always me, or if I think God's out to get me, or someone hates me, these things can really be debilitating. They can cause anxiety and depression because we're unable to understand ourselves from Scripture out. And it takes work. It takes work to think, what does God say about me? That's what the music this morning was so beautiful because it starts with what God says about you. And what we're going to be in in Romans today is what God says about everyone who has believed in him, everyone who's trusted Christ. This is true for you, even when things go sideways. Romans is a big part of this, about thinking correctly about a restored relationship to God. Now, this is the part where I'm going to give you the context, right? Because we started off in the book of Romans with uh, the sin section, right? And we talked about three different people, the obvious sinner, who's very much cleaner than the day that we first met him, right? The obvious sinner. And then Mr. Moralist, the guy who follows all the rules. He's got lots of rules. And then Mr. Religion, who does religious things so well, that surely he's right with God. And what does Paul say about all these people? They're not. It doesn't matter how hard they're working, how good they seem to be. The only way that you get right with God is how? Trusting in Jesus, Jesus, right? If I trust, I, I rely on Jesus alone. I'm putting my full weight on the stool right now. We believe that. I believe that's a stool. It's not a cement truck. I believe it's a stool. I trust it. And so what that means, when I trust in Jesus, when I put my full weight and reliance on Jesus, it doesn't matter if I'm the religious guy. He's in. He's in. Why? Not because he's religious, because he's trusting in Jesus. What about the rules guy? How does he get in the box? You got to trust in Jesus. What about the worst guy you've ever met? And then what does the Bible say about you? It says that you're, you've been, your sins have been atoned and covered over and made right, that you're declared not guilty before God. Man, that's amazing. And it's not because of the work that they did. It's because of the work that Jesus did. What about redemption, redeemed, bought out of the slave market of sin to be set free? Man, that's a beautiful thing. And these disasters, these train wrecks are there, not because of what they've done, but because of what Jesus has done. They're justified. They're declared legally righteous. And so in this section up here, we have the the sin section, those bad guys, the salvation section. And salvation means that you're justified. The court scene, remember? The judge declares you not guilty on the basis of what Jesus did for you. You're redeemed, purchased from the slave market. How? By trusting in Jesus' personal work, who he is, what he did for you. And you're atoned for that religious scene where your sins are covered over. Last week, we established the priority of faith. And let me just remind you, you know, you might have been like, you might, have, you might be like, you know, Pastor Todd, I've heard this since I was a little kid. I've heard all this stuff about Jesus since I was a little kid. There's a world full of people who have no idea, and they're still over there. There are people in your neighborhood. There are people around you all the time. And so now we're moving into the sanctification section of the book of Romans. What is sanctification? I'm so glad you asked. It means living the Christian life. Living a life every day, day by day, set apart to God, set apart to God, set apart away from the world. Sanctification is being and becoming a person who trusts God through Jesus in every aspect of their lives. The formal definition is to be set apart, set apart to God. 
for his purposes and his use. It means to cooperate with God's ongoing work in your life. It means to become more like Jesus in all that we say and do. And so in this section, we want to talk about living by faith and knowing what God says about you. Take a look at the book of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Probably the most beautiful phrase in the whole Bible until you read another phrase, right? We have peace with God. What that means is that everybody who now has been justified by faith, they have peace with God. And this is not a feeling of peace, right? It's a fact. It's a truth. It's something that you rely on. It's something that you go back to every day when you wake up in the morning and you think, I wonder if I'm okay with God. No, I'm justified by faith. I have it. I have peace. How do I know that? The Bible says. The Bible says. You have peace. Now, we usually use this word for the absence of conflict, but the biblical concept is more about the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom means wholeness. Wholeness. Put togetherness. Everything is right in this relationship with God. That's amazing. Shalom. It's the outward situation of being in a relationship of peace with God. That's true of the one who is justified by faith. You, right? Because what Paul is sort of assuming as we've kind of walked through this step by step, he's assuming that you're following along and that you're agreeing with him. And so now that you're in chapter five, you're with me, right? You're justified by faith. And if you are justified, if you trust Jesus, you have peace with God. Full stop. Stay there for a minute. This fact should help you feel something, but it is not the feeling of peace that Paul's talking about. It's the fact of peace. He goes on where he says you stand in God's grace. Now the word grace means favor, that God looks at you with favor, that he wants good things for you, that he wants positive, healthy, happy things for you. The state or realm into which God's redeeming work transfers the believer. It's the realm in which grace reigns, a realm that is set in contrast to the domain of the law. What's the best that you can do over here? Live a good life. What's the best that you can hope for over here? Standing in God's grace. Outside God's grace, inside God's grace. I'll take this every day, all day long. You have joy. We boast or rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, hope in the Bible is something different. I hope I get Legos for Christmas. <laughs> I might get Legos. I might not get Legos. I actually have a lot of Legos that I haven't built, so probably not. I hope. I hope my wife loves me. Oh, no, no, no. She does, right? She signed the mortgage with me. Pretty sure that we're, are we in love? Okay, all right, just checking. <laughs> we're good, right? Now, that's, I hope my wife loves me means I have a confident expectation that she loves me, Right? I may or may not get Legos, but if I wake up in the morning and she's still there, she loves me. If anything changes, you let me know. <laughs> Hope means a confident expectation that God will fulfill his promises. It doesn't mean that I can just wish for something and God's going to fulfill my wishes. That's different. God fulfills his promises to me, and I can get kind of bold about that. When God promises me something, I can say, no, 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 Lord, you said right here, this is the, the fact, this is the case. You have joy. We have peace. 
We, ha- we stand in grace. We rejoice in confident expectations of God's restoration. But what about suffering? What if I don't feel peace and grace and joy? Paul says something about that. The theological dictionary says that suffering is this, to bear pain, distress, or injury. Well, thank you, dictionary. I wasn't sure. Some suffering you can attribute to evil. Undeserved suffering is endured by faith. Paul in the Bible tells me that suffering is not something that I won't have as a Christian. It's not happy all day long. Sometimes the Christian life involves me literally suffering things. Well, I'd rather not. Wouldn't you rather not? Wouldn't you rather become a Christian and then suffer nothing? But then what kind of Christianity would you have? You would have this thin veneer Christianity, not something that penetrates to your very soul and certainly not something that changes the world, right? Because that's what we're kind of called to do, to be different in the world. If Christians have peace with God, why doesn't God remove all suffering from the Christian? Paul explains that we glory or rejoice in suffering because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance is the ability to endure hardship because the world is still broken by sin. The world that we live in is broken by sin and you're left here for a purpose and some of that purpose is to endure. Perseverance, the ability to endure hardship produces character. And the word character means something that has been tested and found to be worthwhile. Something that has been tested. A faith, a confidence in God that has been tested. How would you test that? By living in a broken world and enduring. And character produces hope, a confident expectation that God will fulfill his promises. And I want to tell you this, and I want you to stick it in your head. The value of a hope-filled character outweighs the burden of suffering. The value of a hope-filled character outweighs the burden of suffering, and not even God himself excluded himself from suffering. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He suffered. He suffered. He didn't take a pass. And everything that you suffer is either about building your character or the character of the community that you're a part of. Because sometimes what's happening to me is for me and for you. And sometimes what's happening for you is for you and for the people around you. In the early church around 300 AD, now I I love historical examples, so you have to work with me, right? Around 300 AD, there was a plague in the city of Caesarea so bad that people started to leave the city right? People getting the plague and starting to die literally all around in that spot. And so people left for the hills. You know who stayed? The Christians. The Christians. Because they're crazy, right? No, because they had character. Because they had hope. They knew that if they died helping people dying of the plague, that their eternity was set. That their life would continue on with God. And what greater evidence, what greater witness could you have than to help someone who could never do anything for you? Let me read you a quote. A church historian at the time said this, All day long, Some of them, the Christians, tended to the dying and to their burial. Countless numbers with no one to care for them. Plague victims. Others gathered together from all parts of the city, a multitude of those withered from famine and distributed bread to them all. That's what we're supposed to look like as a community, as a group of people who trust the Lord. We're supposed to be the people who run in and help people who can't help themselves. What's the character of that community? Because the value of character outweighs the burden of suffering. And then Paul points out the love that God has for you. Those who are justified by faith have has, had God's love poured out into their hearts through the Holy Spirit. God loves you. That is such an amazing thing for me. 
that I can stand in, in God's grace, that I can have peace, that I can just be filled with God's love. But you know, we have a very real tendency to work backwards, don't we? You see, we work backwards from the thing that happens to how God feels about me all the time. If I'm having a bad day, it must be because I didn't do my devotions this morning. You know, that's actually kind of pagan thinking. Pagans interpret the world as how God thinks about them in the moment. Christians interpret the Bible. And so in that moment when, you know, my car is broken down or something happens, I need to remember Romans 5. God loves me. How do I respond to this suffering? Well, it's supposed to produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and that character produces hope. And So God is always constantly working in me to work on me to be a better me. We have a very real tendency to work backwards. Suppose there are devastating hurricanes in Florida. I think that's probably more about geography than sin, although there's plenty of sin in Florida, right? But there's also plenty of churches in Florida. How do I figure out when God's punishing somebody? I don't need to figure it out. I just go back to the Bible. Go back to the Bible and develop your character. You have peace. You stand in grace. And we rejoice in God's glory because we are loved by God. This new status that you have doesn't eliminate suffering. Being a Christian does not eliminate suffering from your life. I wish it did. But a suffering Christian... When you see somebody suffering, it's not necessarily because they're doing something wrong or because they're a bad person. If you're suffering because of bad choices, own up to your response, your bad choices. Learn to make choices guided by scripture. If you see someone suffering, you may have a responsibility towards that person, right? Not to come alongside and say, well, you have peace with God. You can smack those people. I gave you permission. You really can. What are you supposed to do when somebody's suffering? You come and help. You come and help. You come wrap your arms around. You come and you pray with them. You don't need to remind them about the Bible just yet. They'll get to it. When someone is suffering, when someone is hurting, when someone is in pain, you wrap your arms around them and you say, hey, how can I help? If you see someone suffering, you might have a responsibility towards that person. And so Paul mentions this God, that God has poured out his love. He goes on to remind his fellow believers that God loved us even while we were sinners because living by faith means living in light of God's incredible love for you. Look at the text. Verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, there's something interesting from a a structural, grammatical perspective that I know you appreciate, right? Paul uses the word died at the end of the sentence to emphasize it, right? That the death of Christ was not because you were so valuable. He died for the ungodly. He died for you when you were over here. He died for you before. A couple years ago, my my good friend uh, almost died. And he's a good guy. Like, he is such a good guy. I'm sometimes, I wouldn't say envious. I admire? Wow. Fine. (laughs) I'm envious. He's got, a, he's got a great life. He's got a great family. Uh, his kids are doing great. He, uh, he teaches Bible at a Bible co- uh, university. So he's just, he's smart. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's administrative. I could go tell my friend Michael just about anything, and I know that he would still love me through it, even if I was wrong. We like to talk theology, and that's where he's wrong. And he had this, uh, he had a, an aortic dissection. So the big aorta that leads from his heart to everything else split lengthwise and he started to bleed out internally. And when I found out about it, it was a Sunday morning. He was in the hospital. He was actually in surgery and they said he's got a 20% chance to make it to the hospital. Now he's got a 20% chance to make it through surgery and he's in surgery right now. And let me tell you, I had to fight 
to keep from jumping in my truck and heading down to help because he's that good of a friend to me. I love this guy. But I can tell you this. I'm not going to die in his place. I'll carry his groceries in. I'll cut his grass for him, right? If he needs a little money, I'll see if Ruthann has any money. <laughs> I would not die in his place. And that leads me to this question. Why would God let Christ die for anyone, much less me? A theologian, a Catholic theologian, Romano Gardini says this, Precisely here lies hidden the kernel of Christianity. Before such an unheard of thought, the intellect bogs down. Once at this point, a friend gave me a clue that helped my understanding more than any measure of bare reason, he said. But love does such things. Again and again, these words have come to the rescue when the mind has stopped short at some intellectual impasse. You see, every time this guy tries to think about why in the world would Christ die for anybody, he says, love. Love. Now you think about who would you die for? Who would you lay your life down for? Ladies, look at your man. Why'd you look the wrong way? <laughs> Love does such things. Look at your kids. You'd give yourself for your kids, wouldn't you? How much more does God love you? I can't imagine that God loves me more than I love my kids or my grandkids. But he does. I can't imagine that God loves my grandkids more than me. And he does. He does. How do I know? The cross. What Jesus did on the cross was because of love. Love does such things. It does things that are beyond counting. And so Jesus' Jesus's death on the cross is not a measure of how much we're worth. It's a measure of how incredible God's love is for you. What do you have as a Christian? You have peace with God. You stand in His grace. Love has been poured out on you. Suffering builds character. And Jesus died to bring you into a right relationship with God. This changes how you view yourself. This changes how you value yourself, and this changes how you view and value everyone around you. The person that you hate the most, God loves, deeply and intensely and all the way to the cross. Jesus died to bring you into that right relationship with God. If you just read this section of Romans, if you took Romans 5 to 11, 5, 1 through 11, and every morning when you got up, you read it, and then lived your day, and then every night before you lay down and go to sleep, you read it again. How would that change the way you think and view yourself and everyone around you? And I get it. Believe me. When I'm in the middle of suffering, do you know what I want? Less suffering. I do. But character outweighs suffering. So we have to practice it. We have to go back to this text over and over and over again. I have to think from the Bible out. And that means this needs to become something that I'm really familiar with, something that I'm really catching, something I'm really repeating. Living by faith means that we're saved by wrath. Chapter 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood... How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul's using two arguments here. They're arguments from the lesser to the greater. If you've been saved by the blood of Christ, how much more, right? And so the first how much more is if we're, if we're justified, declared legally righteous by his blood, how much more will you be saved from wrath? You see, there's two options, right? You can be saved from wrath or you can experience the wrath of God. Because these two options are just two options. There's not a third option. There's not another out. There's not, you know, in modern culture we have this view of 
of this, right? We have this view that, well, surely God's going to just not be wrathful, right? I mean, hell is just a place where we drink with our friends. No. God's wrath, it's real, it's unloaded, it's terrifying. But if Christ died for you there, how much more will you be saved from his wrath? And that's where we as Christians, we have that shorthand, right? Are you saved? And that's what it means. You've been transferred from over here. You've been saved. You've been rescued. You're in the right spot. You're reconciled to God. So the first from the lesser to the greater argument says, if this is true, if you've been declared legally righteous by his blood, how much more will you be saved from his wrath? Second, if God reconciled his enemies, the objects of his wrath, while they were enemies, then how much more will you be saved from his life, through his life, right? Because Christ, after he came off the cross, he was buried in the tomb, and he was raised up to sit at the right hand of God the Father. He lives even now today. And he loves you actively from that position of power and authority. How much more will you be saved through his life? And you can recall with me that Paul has described people in the sin section as under the wrath of God. Let me just bounce back to Romans 1.18, where it says this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Wrath. But it's all over there, and it's not over here. Saved becomes that shorthand for that restored relationship that we have with God. Reconciled. The word reconciliation that Paul uses a number of times there means to reestablish proper, friendly, interpersonal relations after these have been disrupted or broken. We were alienated. We are saved. How? Because we're justified by faith. You know, Christians have disordered automatic thoughts too. Right? It's not something that's just for people who don't have the Bible and understand Scripture. We have disordered automatic thoughts. We start our day and suddenly we think that we're underperforming, that we didn't pray enough, that we didn't read enough, we haven't been kind enough. It only gets worse when you meet a friend for coffee and you start comparing, hey, how's your day going? And your friend's like, oh, it's going fantastic. Oh, great. (laughs) My brother, uh, he said to me the other day, He said, tell me about your troubles so I can forget mine. So I unload it. (laughs) And here you go. Carry this for a while. He he felt better. We have disordered automatic thoughts. And you see, that's the thing. If you think that something that you're suffering is God trying to punish you or be mad at you, you don't understand Scripture. Go back here, right? Because what that suffering is supposed to do is to create in you the kind of character that people look at and go, I cannot believe that you went through all of that and you still love Jesus. You bet I do. You bet I do, because I know that God is working on my character, and I know that God is working on the character of my community so that we together are something different. You see, if somebody walks in here off the street and they look around, and they're like, man, there's nothing different here, they'll turn around and walk right back out. But if they walk in here and they're like, these people are crazy. <laughs> they're glorying in their sufferings. They're sharing the burden with one another. That's incredible. That's world changing. And so if you're suffering through something, don't hold back. Come tell me about it. I'll suffer with you. You can cry on my shoulder. God gave me great big shoulders. You can cry on them all you want. I got leather ears. You can chew on them. You can't really chew on them. That's a metaphor. (laughs) You can tell me your troubles. We have disordered automatic thoughts too. We think that suffering is God trying to get me. It's not. It's not. You have peace with God. And every time you're suffering, come back here. Come back here and cry out to God. God, you say I have this. I don't feel it right now. And you know, God might say back to you, you have a refrigerator, but you don't feel cool, do you? All right, that that was a risky joke. I'm sorry. (laughs) Having something and feeling something are different things. 
But when you come back here and you remind yourself over and over and over again that this is what you have, then you can cry out to God and say, God, I don't feel it right now. God, I haven't arrived at hope. God, I'm not even sure that I've arrived at character yet. God, I don't think I can persevere. And that's where the community is supposed to wrap around you in that moment to feel those feelings with you. You might not be at hope yet, but God loves you because we come from the scriptures and we go out. You know that God, suffering is not God's anger directed at you. Suffering produces character in you. And sometimes the suffering that you go through is for the community to understand this and to act on it. We always close with four questions. What is God speaking to you from this text? The first question is this. Are you saved? If you don't know for sure that you're here, we have to talk, right? Because there, there's no guarantee that you wake up tomorrow. We have to talk. Are your thoughts about yourself ordered or disordered? Did you wake up this morning thinking, man, if I don't make it to church, God's going to smack me. I don't want you to come to church for that. I want you to come to church because you love to be here and you want to learn about God. You want to learn about your relationship to God, your responsibilities to God. How are you thinking about other people? Because, see, I've got to think correctly about myself, but I also have to think correctly about people that maybe I don't like. People who maybe not been fair to me or mean to me. That's true for all of us. What's God speaking to you from this text? What do you need to do about it? Maybe at a minimum, you take these 11 verses and you make it your every day, morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening, so much that it's on the tip of your brain so that when something happens, you go back and you're like, wait a minute, now I remember Romans 5, 1 through 11. How can we help? When someone is suffering, don't quote Bible verses in the middle of suffering, right? When someone is suffering, how can you enter in and be helpful with practical things rather than just dropping Bible verses on them? How can we help? And who else needs to hear about it? Who else do you know? Who do you know who's not in Romans 5? And how do you get there? And how do you help them get there? Let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. I thank you, Father, for Romans 5, for knowing that suffering doesn't mean that I'm on the outs with you, but suffering means that you're trying to build in me the character that I'm going to need to be in this world that's still broken by sin. Father, I pray for those people who haven't yet crossed over, who haven't yet trusted you, who aren't justified by faith. I pray, Lord, that they make that decision even now. And Father, in that decision, help us to live in peace and grace and love. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you pour down on us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you got on the stand, so we're going to do two new things. Go ahead and stand. No, that's wait for me. Thank you, though. It's very polite. Uh, number one, we're going to do a new song. You've already won, uh, which basically kind of sums up a little bit of, we already have that peace with God. And then, when we get done with the song, we always, um, actually Jeff's coming up today to do our, our closing and challenge, and then we play the chorus one more time while you guys leave. But today, we want you to stay. Do that last chorus with us after the challenge. Let's sing that together, and then we'll all leave together. Got it? Okay.
Welcome to Thanksgiving week. Everyone here has a lot to be thankful for this year, not just the big turkey dinner you're going to be consuming or the, your family, your friends, your health, your job, your home, uh, the short work week, or some chocolate. But uh, if you trust in Jesus, we have things to be thankful for as well. Okay, so my challenge this year for you is to go out and share that gift with others. Uh, we all want to wish you all a great Thanksgiving. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Now you're in the best. Appreciate it.